here we are again at brand new historical fiction coming soon. And I'm very happy to introduce you all to my friend Kelly Bowen, who's coming to us live from Manitoba. Um, and she's here to talk to us about her new book, The Paris Apartment, which I read and really, really enjoyed. She's a beautiful writer. And the book is up for pre-order right now. So you should order it right now because you always know that you love the books that I recommend. So you should order The Paris Apartment right now. So this is Kelly. Thank you for being here, Kelly. Thank you very much for having me. So nice to see you again. I saw Kelly and I met in 2015 when I was on a little tour across Canada and she she was so kind as to be our, our um, hostess, our MC, our what would you call it back then? When you Hostess to- slash MC. Yeah, that Susanna. sounds about right. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> Susanna Kearsley and we did a little little chat. It was very nice there. So um, it's been a while. It's very nice to see you. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about Kelly and then about the book. And then we'll have a little read. Um, Kelly Bowen, award-winning author, grew up in Manitoba, Canada, and attended the University of Manitoba, where she earned a Bachelor of Science and Master of Science degree in veterinary studies. She worked as a research scientist before realizing her dream to be a writer of historical fiction and has an amazing dozen Regency era, era romance novels to her name. Currently, Kelly lives in Winnipeg with her husband and two sons. That's me. And, yes. And <laughs> uh, the Paris Apartment, again, pre-order today. Um, it says, secrets protect her past, but the truth holds the key to her future. London, 2017. When Aurelia Leclerc inherits an opulent Paris apartment, she is shocked to discover her grandmother's hidden secrets, including a treasure trove of famous art and couture gowns. One obscure painting leads her to Gabrielle Seymour, a highly respected art restorer with his own mysterious past. Together, they attempt to uncover the truths concealed within the apartment's walls. Paris, 1942. The Germans may occupy the City of Lights, but glamorous Estelle Allard flourishes in a world separate from the hardships of war. Yet when the Nazis come for her dearest friends, Estelle doesn't hesitate to help them no matter the cost. As she works against the forces intent on destroying those she holds dear, she can't know that her actions will have ramifications for generations to come. Set 75 years apart, Against the perilous and prosperous Paris, both Estelle and Leah must unearth hidden courage as they navigate the dangers of a changing world, altering history and their family's futures forever. That's so exciting. And it's a very <laughs> exciting book. And this is how it looks. And I was asking Kelly, she and I do this thing, and I think that a lot of us do this, is that when we're writing, we sometimes base our characters on specific celebrities. And so I asked Kelly who these people represented. Who's this in your book? That is who? So that, uh, it, it's interesting um, when I was writing, the characters from the past narrative um, seemed to be much more relatable in my head anyways to what yeah. I had. So Blake Lively, um, I had her in my head as I was writing the character of Estelle. She's very glamorous, very magnetic, but somewhat reserved. She's very, very classy. Um, so that's kind of her. And yeah. she was kind of skulking around the back of my mind when I was when I was writing her character. And I saw her perfectly, for sure I did. And then this one. Okay, so that's that yeah, that's Sophie. So that's the other uh, the other heroine from the past narrative. Um, and she is the one that becomes an SOE agent uh, during during the course of the book. And um, I watched the watch the series of Vikings where Gunhild um, uh, is played, and that's very much what I had. Very fierce, just very steady, uh, yeah. And I kind of had her in my mind as I was writing that character. Yep, I could see her. And yep. finally, and then there's Jerome, who ends up kind of connecting the two. Uh, I won't tell you too much without spoiling the book, uh, and he's. Uh, that particular character um, is from Bernard Cornwell's The Last Kingdom series, which I loved the series. And I turned on the show with a healthy dose of skepticism because series are sometimes not nearly as good as, good. the show isn't not nearly as good as the series. Oh. Uh, but his character of Finnan, who is um, Uhtred's uh, best friend and loyal, loyal uh, warrior, uh, that was him to a T. It's perfect. I love that. It's kind of fun because if you don't know 
you know, it's very hard work being an author, especially when you have to study characters because then sometimes you have to turn on movies and you have to- It's it hard. It's hard. You have to look yes. at his movements and his voice and you have to watch him walk a lot. And it's, Right, and you have to put up pictures of beautiful people all over your wall. I know. It's, it's terrible. A, it's a sacrifice <laughs> we make. It's, it's a junk perp, <laughs> completely. <laughs> all right. Well, Kelly, I'm going to- uh, I'm going to disappear into a tiny little uh, square here, if I can. Okay. And then All right, and I'm going to read the first chapter in this book. Please. Okay. Thank you so much. the first, yeah, the first chapter in this book uh, starts in the present, uh, and it starts uh, when Aurelia, my my character, uh, discovers the secrets that her grandmother has left her. So I will start here. Uh, Paris, France, June tenth, two thousand and seventeen. The woman was nude, painted in a swirl of angry scarlets and oranges. The woman's arms were flung over her head, her hands outstretched, her hair a cloud of midnight floating behind her. Caught in the shaft of light that fell through the open apartment door, she gazed out with dark eyes from her canvas, angry and accusing, as if she resented the intrusion of her space and privacy. Leah froze in the open doorway, one hand clutching the heavy key and the other gripping the packet of neatly organized legal papers that said she had ever right to be here. And that this unknown apartment, along with all its contents, now belonged to her. It's an incredible valuable property, the lawyers had assured her. Your grandmother must have loved you, the administrative assistant had said enviously as she examined the printed address. And Leah hadn't replied to any of them because grandmother's motives in death were as murky as they had been in life, and Leah couldn't be sure that adoration had figured in either. Utilities should be on, the building's concierge said from the top of the stairs behind Leah. The property caretaker was a surprisingly young woman with a close cropped pink bob and a quick smile who had introduced herself simply as Celeste. Leah had liked her immediately. I'm not often in the office, but I'm always around if you need anything else, just ring me. Thank you, Leah replied faintly, slipping the key into her pocket. You said on the phone that this place was your grandmother's? Celeste leaned casually on the stair railing. Yes, she left it to me when she passed. Or at least that was what the lawyers had said when they had summoned her to their office and laid a steady stream of documents before her. And while the flat had been paid and maintained from account with Grandmere's name on it, as far as Leah knew, Estelle Allard had never lived anywhere other than Marseille. Ah, the woman's expression softened my condolences on her passing. Thank you. It wasn't unexpected, though this apartment was definitely a shock. Not as bad as shocks go, I should think, Celeste remarked. We should all be so lucky. True, Leah acknowledged, playing with the enameled pendant at her throat. Until this morning, the antique necklace had been the only gift Grandma had ever given her, presented without fuss on her 18th birthday. She considered the concierge. How long have you worked here? Six years. And I don't suppose you know anything about this apartment or my grandmother, Estelle Allard? Celeste shook her head. I'm sorry I don't. While I'm familiar with most of the tenants in the building, in truth, I had no idea who owned this apartment, only that it's been unoccupied since I started. On impulse, Leah jammed the packet of paper under her arms and unzipped her po portfolio bag. From inside, she withdrew a small painting, about the size of a legal document. It was a vivid, if somewhat clumsy, painting of a manor house surrounded by clumps of emerald trees and silhouetted against a cobalt sky. Along with the key to this apartment, the painting had been the only other thing her grandmother had specifically left her. What about the name Seymour, William Seymour? Does that sound familiar? Leah asked, holding the painting towards Celeste. Celeste shook her head again. No. May I ask who he was? No clue, other than the artist who signed this painting. Oh, Celeste looked intrigued. Were you thinking that he was once a tenant here? I, I have no idea. Leah sighed, sliding the little painting back into her bag. She really hadn't expected an answer, but she had nothing to lose by asking. I can check the building's records for you if you like, Celeste offered. We have archives going back a lot of years. If a William Seymour lived here at one point in time, I might be able to find out. Leah was touched by the kindness of the offer. No, that's all right. She didn't want to waste this woman's time, at least until she had done a little research of her own. Sure, but if you reconsider, just let me know. Thank you. I will. Celeste seemed to hesitate. Are you planning to live here? She finally asked. Leah opened her mouth to answer and then closed it. The simple answer was yes, at least temporarily. But beyond temporarily, Leah had no simple answer for that. None of my business. The woman ducked her head. I'm sorry. Don't be, Leah smiled. I haven't made a decision yet. I hope you stay, Celeste said sincerely. It would be nice to have the sound of a lock being released accompanied by a brief torrent of hysterical barking made Leah turn. An elderly woman emerged from the apartment across the landing and shuffled towards her. 
A small bundle of writhing white fur was clamped under warm arm, a pointing cane clutched in her other hand. She was dressed like a model from a mid-century American advert peddling soaps or vacuums in a wide skirted photo dress with a pinched waist and a string of heavy pearls around her throat. Her white hair was curled around a livery powdered face and her lipstick was an angry crimson. Color had bled into the deep lines that tracked outward from her lips and the whole effect was, not, was rather macabre. Unbidden, Aurelia could almost hear Grandma Tisk in approval. One should never no notice your cosmetics, Leah, unless, of course, you only wish to be noticed but not seen. At the time, an adolescent lip gloss loving Leah remembered being annoyed at the cryptic critical comment. <laughs> now Leah couldn't say that Grandma had been wrong. Leah's neighbor was now shuffling across the marble floor, her eyes fixed beyond Leah at the tall nude painting propped up inside the apartment, invisible in the meager light. She looked as shocked as Leah had felt when she had first opened the door, though that shock was fading into clear condemnation. Leah pasted on a smile and stepped more fully into her doorway, blocking the view inside. The woman scowled and craned her neck, trying to peer past. Good afternoon, Leah said politely, her ingrained boarding school manners demanding that she make some sort of greeting. In response, the dog refumed, resumed its frantic tirade, the shrill noise bouncing mercilessly off the mar marble floor and plaster walls. The woman's face soured further, and she produced a piece of sausage from somewhere in the folds of her dress. That silenced the barking, two beady eyes now fixed not on Leah, but the prize held in claw-like fingers. You own this apartment? The woman asked into the ensuing quiet with a voice like sandpaper. Yes, a fact that was still so, so new and novel that it was hard to answer with conviction. I've lived here my entire life, since 1943, the woman said, her eyes narrowing. Leah's smile was slipping. Um, that's a long time. I know everything that goes on in this building. And in all that time, no one has ever gone in or come out of that apartment until now. Mm. Leah made some non-committal sound. She wasn't sure if that was a question, a statement or an accusation. She adjusted her grip on the legal envelope, pressing it against her chest. You living here by yourself? Her gaze shifted to Leah's left hand. I beg your pardon? Leah resisted the urge to shove her hand in her pocket. You seem old not to have a husband. Too late now, I suppose. Unfortunate. Leah blinked, uncertain she had heard right. I'm sorry? I know your type, Leah's neighbor sniffed, her eyes lingering first on Leah's heavy backpack and then the portfolio bag, and finally on her bare shoulders and the straps of her red sundress tied around her neck. My type? Leah's patience was wearing thin and irritation was starting to creep in. I don't want to hear your music, no drugs or booze or parties. No strange men prowling around my door at all hours of the night looking for you. Oh, I'll try to keep the men confined to daylight hours, Leah replied pleasantly, unable to help herself. Celeste, who had remained silent through the entire exchange, snorted and laughed before trying to cover it up with a cough. The woman's head snapped around. Good afternoon, Miss Hoffman. Celeste composed herself. How are you doing today? Miss Hoffman gave the woman's pink hair a hard look, scarlet lips twisting into a sneer. Degenerate, she muttered. Celeste's phone chimed and she glanced down at the screen. Duty calls, she said, shooting Leah an apologetic glance. Let me know if you need anything and welcome to the building. She pushed herself off the railing and vanished down the stairs, triggering another hysterical tirade of barking. Leah used the distraction to retreat into her apartment and close the door behind her, abruptly enveloping herself in a stuffy darkness, but saving herself from further conversation. No wonder you're angry, she muttered in the direction of the nude canvas that rested, some rested somewhere in front of her. I'd be angry too if I lived across from a neighbor like that since 1943. She didn't get an answer. The air in the apartment was thick with the scent of age and dust, suggesting that the apartment had been unoccupied for far longer than the six years Celeste knew about. Leah set her belongings down and let her eyes adjust to the gloom. Deeper in the apartment, on the side that would face the wide sunny street, faint lines of light were seeping around what Leah surmised must be heavy curtains covering the windows. Enough light to give the suggestion of shapes, but not enough for her to see anything clearly. Carefully, Leah inched forward out of the foyer, past the dim outline of the canvas, and made her way towards the windows. The floor beneath her creaked with each step, as if it, too, resented her intrusion. She reached the curtain wall and extended her hand, the tips of her fingers colliding with the heavy fabric that felt like damask. So far, so good. Nothing had jumped out or fallen on her head or run over her toes. She found the edge of the curtain, rings rattling on the rod somewhere above. Without hesitating, she pulled the curtain back and regretted it immediately. As blinding sunlight spilled through the antique panes, thick choking clouds of dust bullowed around her. Leah gagged and coughed, her eyes instantly watering. She fumbled frantically with a latch on the window, relieved beyond measure when it reluctantly gave way. She pushed one of the leaded glass panels open a crack, ignoring the groan of protests from the hinges and pressed her face out into the fresh air. 
She stayed that way for a good minute, her head stuck out the window, gasping and hacking and trying not to imagine how ridiculous she must look to people passing down below. Perhaps she should have just left the apartment door wide open. Perhaps she should have sent the charming Miss Hoffman in first. Her coughing finally subsiding, Leah took a deep fortifying breath and straightened, bracing herself for what she might find. She turned slowly away from the window and discovered that upon her death, Grandmere had not left Leah an apartment at all. She'd left Leah a museum. Dust still swirled, but the brilliant light illuminated walls covered in patterned wallpaper, the gray blue of a stormy sky. Dozens of painted landscapes and seascapes and gilded frames were hung on the wall opposite the windows, some capturing images of bucolic country scenes, others freezing ships forever in their quest across the horizon, and each one bursting with saturated color. In the center of the room, a polyester sulfurs and dust-colored tur turquoise faced off against each other across a wide Persian rug. A long writing desk bridged the ends of the sofas closest to Leah, and it was against the desk that the tall nude canvas had been propped, facing the door to greet anyone who entered. On the back wall adjacent to the windows, an elaborate marble mantelpiece swept over an empty hearth. A bracket had been mounted to the wall high above the fireplace, suggesting that a piece of art had once hung in the tall space, although whatever was that once there wasn't now. And above her head, a chandelier hung from the center of the room, its dripping dazzling crystals muted only partially by dust. On unfeeling legs, Leah headed deeper into the apartment. She stopped at a dainty side table on the far end of the sofa and examined a collection of framed photos. With care, she picked up the first and wiped the glass. A young woman had been captured leaning against the light post in front of a jazz club, wearing a silky beaded dress that clung to each and every curve like a second skin. A first stole draped carelessly over her shoulders. She held a cigarette holder in one hand, her eyes meeting the camera's lens with smoky, sensual indifference. Leah turned it over. Estella Loud, Montmartre, 1938, was written in pencil across the back. Leah swallowed hard. Though she had been told repeatedly by the estate lawyers that this apartment was the domain of Estella Lard, Leah realized that she hadn't truly believed it until right now. She hadn't truly believed that her grandmother, who had not once in her life mentioned that she had ever traveled to Paris, much less lived here, had kept a secret of this magnitude for this long. And Leah couldn't even begin to imagine why she would have done so. She set the photo back down and examined the second. In this one, the beautiful Estelle was behind the wheel of a low-slung Mercedes, leaning out of the window and laughing at the photographer. Her hair was loose over her shoulders, a jaunty hat cocked over one eye. Leah blinked, trying to reconcile these sultry, fearless images with the rigid, reserved woman Leah had known. She failed miserably. She turned her attention to the last of the photos and frowned. A German officer stared back at her, unsmiling and severe. From his uniform, it was clear that it was an image of, from the First World War. Leah frowned and turned it over, but there was nothing written on the back. She set the photo down and glanced at a pile of magazines stacked beside it. She slid the top one to the side. The issue beneath, devoid of dust, was easy to read. Signal blazed from the upper left corner in bold red text, the cover beneath dominated by an image of a Nazi soldier with an intense expression. A strip of the same bold red cover ran down the, spi si ran down the spine of the magazine. September 1942, easily, easily visible at the top. Leah snatched her hand away. This is not happening, she said into the silence, as if saying it out loud would make it true, because she already knew without opening the magazine what she'd find. German propaganda and glossy pro-Nazi photos, all published at a time when Nazis had overrun and occupied this very city. Leah stared again at a young Estelle Allard laughing from her Mercedes and the nameless German officer before she turned away from the photos and the magazines and all their ominous implications. With a queasy dread settling into her gut, she made her way past the ornate hearth mantel and around the corner. Here, the space narrowed into a formal dining room. The center was dominated by a rosewood table surrounded by eight matching chairs. On the wall to her right, a cabinet taller than she was lined the space, rows of crystal, silver, and porcelain dinnerware displayed on the shelves. On the wall opposite the cabinet was another collection of paintings, striking and arresting portraits of men and women in clothing from centuries past. Leah bit her lip hard enough to hurt as dread intensified. Art had been a desirable souvenir from the Nazis during the occupation, entire collection stolen. Stop it, Leah. She shook her head, not caring how foolish she sounded talking to no one. Don't be absurd. Yes, there was Nazi propaganda in the apartment, but a single photo and a handful of magazines did not mean that the paintings on these walls had been stolen or otherwise illicitly obtained. It did not mean that her grandmother had deliberately kept this collection here in this apartment for any other reason than she had liked art when she had been younger. Conjuring conspiracy theories was best left to Hollywood and radical zealots. 
Leah tore her gaze from the paintings and continued through the dining room, stepping into a hallway. On her right, a doorway opened up into the kitchen with a tiny stove, a small refrigerator, and a deep sink set into, into a countertop free of clutter, save for a single crystal hot tumbler. Just to her left, a set of French doors stood open, the dim outline of a four-post bed denoting the last space as a bedroom. As in the living room, lines of sunlight from tall windows were visible on the far wall. Leah entered the room, skirted the bed, and with a great deal more care than she had taken earlier, eased the heavy curtains open. In the light, the room has a decidedly feminine space, the walls papered in a shade of rose, the edges near the ceiling only slightly yellowed and discolored. The room consisted of a double bed, a dressing table, and a chair, and an enormous wardrobe, all carved with a provincial flair. The bed was neatly made, and the linens, once washed, would likely be the same rose hue as the walls. The room was impeccably tidy, save for a garment that had been tossed carelessly on top of the smooth coverlet, crumpled and forgotten and dulled by dust. It was an evening gown, Leah realized, moving to lift it up by the thin straps. A stunning creation of lemon yellow chiffon and crepe, beaded with crystals and something that would have been obscenely expensive no matter what century it had been purchased in. Not something that one would toss aside like a pair of old socks. Bewildered, she let the dress drop back to the bed and eyed the narrow arched doorway in the corner beside the wardrobe. It led into what looked like a modern walk-in closet. A dressing room, Leah guessed, though there was almost no space to walk in. On both sides, dresses and gowns and furs and coats hung crammed together, spilling out on top of one another in such numbers that Leah couldn't even see the back wall. Shoes lined the floor, dozens and dozens of pairs, and along the shelf at the top, hat boxes were stacked. Smaller jewelry boxes, some of them covered in leather and satin, were piled in front. Good Lord, Leah mumbled, the excess hard to comprehend. She backed away and cautiously opened the wardrobe next, expecting to be inundated with another jumble of extravagance. But the wardrobe was almost empty, the cavernous interior yielding only a half dozen gowns. Those gowns, protected from years of dust, were a collection of couture, silks, and satins, each one exquisitely embroidered, appliqued, and detailed. Leah ran her fingers along the length of the sapphire-colored skirt before pulling her hand back, afraid that she would soil the fabric. She closed the wardrobe and rested her forehead against the double doors. The gowns, the shoes, the furs, there was a fortune in clothing here, just like there was a fortune in fine furnishings and fine art, and all of it hidden for over 70 years. Leah felt as though she had fallen down a rabbit hole, an overwhelming, insane rabbit hole that made a jump to abhorrent conclusions far too easy. She lifted her head and took a steadying breath. Assumptions never ended well. A career dedicated to science had taught her that. She would give her grandmother the benefit of the doubt. She would not believe the worst until such time as she was presented with irrefutable proof. For right now, she would put conjecture aside. Instead, she would make a list of things that needed to be done, tasks that required her attention immediately. Lists were made of numbers and needs and not speculation and suppositions. Lists were ordered and rational, and they had always helped her focus on what she could control when presented with disorder and uncertainty. Yes, a carefully curated collection of lists was exactly what she needed right now. Feeling a little better, Leah headed back towards the bedroom doors, but stopped abruptly as she caught sight of her reflection. A little tarnished and spotted, the mirror mounted above the dessing table nonetheless revealed the trouble lines that still suffused Leah's features. Almost involuntarily, she sank into the little chair, ignoring the dust and not taking her eyes off her reflection. Had her grandmother been the last to be reflected in this mirror? And if Leah could go back in time, what would she have seen? Who would she have seen? Her eyes dropped to the surface of the dressing table. A collection of decorative glass bottles huddled in the center, and a pair of women's gloves lay discarded behind, beside them, abandoned where they had been dropped. Beside the gloves, propped up against the bottom of the mirror, was a small card. A postcard of some sort, Leah thought, as she reached for it. It was black and white photo of a long, looming building, a row of Roman columns lining the entire facade like an ancient temple. An impressive display of architecture, marred only by the Nazi flags snapping proudly in the wind in the foreground. Dread returned and manifested into something far more sinister. Very slowly, Leah turned the postcard over. For the lovely Estelle, it read in scrawled faded ink, with thanks, Herman Goring. Leah dropped the postcard as though it had bitten her and stumbled to her feet, knocking the little chair to the side. Despair roared with revulsion. She was such a fool. Only a fool would have clung to hope. Only a delusional fool would have refused to truly accept the evidence scattered all over this apartment. As far as irrefutable proof went, Leah couldn't imagine anything more damning. She still had no idea why her grandmother had chosen to leave her this apartment, but the reason that she had kept its existence a secret was abundantly clear. Because her grandmother, a woman who had hung the French flag out every May in celebration, 
a woman who had repeatedly declared her love for her country hadn't been a patriotic citizen at all. Her grandmother had been a liar and a traitor and a fraud. Her grandmother had been a Nazi collaborator. And that's the end of chapter one. Wow, that's so great. I love that. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love listening. It's wonderful. So I wanted to ask you some questions about that. I love the way when you, when you walk into that apartment, she's surrounded by all the artwork and then the couture. That must have been so much fun to research. Did you yes, get into that? I, I'm... Yeah, I'm a, I, I'm kind of an art an art uh, enthusiast. Uh, in a lot of my books, you'll find art popping up in strange places for symbolism or something that draws people together. And uh, yeah, so researching um, the art that ends up that that's on the walls and that ends up getting discovered in that apartment, um, different different styles, different time periods, different types of artists, different movements. Um, that was a lot of fun. Again. Sometimes my job is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was fascinating. I love the way you layered that in there. And then the couture. There's a yes. lot of that. At, it, again, I'm, I'm less familiar with couture. Um, fashion is not normally my thing. I'm, I'm not known by my friends as overly fashionable. <laughs> but it was fun uh, looking, uh, like doing just on the online research and the beautiful uh, clothing and gowns. Um, is, well, in Paris that all the couture houses um, who managed to stay open, some of them had managed to stay open during the war and just beautiful. Like just, it's a, they're works of art in themselves. Yes, for sure they are. So how did you get interested in this whole, like how did you start with this book? What, what grabbed you and brought you into this whole, this whole world? Where did it start? So uh, it, I've always, wanted to write something set in World War II. Um, as the uh, regular family historian in my family, I, I tend to get all the old things that people uh, find in, in their uh, cupboards and closets. Yeah. Uh, and one of those things a number of years ago that came to me was um, a diary from my great uncle who served in World War I. Uh, he was killed in, ac in action uh, in France and he's buried in France. Uh, but uh, reading his diary, he was very detailed in his experiences and his preparations and kind of just day-to-day -day, uh, experiences that he, that he lived through. And so that was quite fascinating. And then uh, his, his younger brother and then my other grandfather both served in World War II. Uh, and they did not uh, keep a diary. They did not speak of the war, uh, certainly not to their children, certainly not to their grandchildren. Um, but my grandfather, who I was closest with, uh, who served in the RCME, uh, kept quite an extensive collection of World War II books. Uh, it was kind of his uh, kind of academic interest uh, in the war that he had served in. And I remember being a kid just sitting up and reading his books. Um, he taught me a lot about radios. That was his thing. He, uh, by the time I was 10, uh, I could build circuit boards. Uh, we fixed radios together. Um, my grade six teachers did not believe that a girl could make a circuit board because she couldn't possibly solder resistors and capacitors together. Um, I helped them get over themselves a little bit. <laughs> um, yeah, so that whole kind of era really interested me. Um, and I read a lot about it. And then I started reading a lot of memoirs of some of the women who had served in combat roles uh, on the Western Front. Um, and they were fairly limited, the combat roles, and they were all agents that had been sent in. Uh, and that really fascinated me. So that's where I kind of took my starting point from. Where do you find all those memoirs and things? Where do you go do uh, The libraries. Um, libraries are always good. Uh, the internet is a wonderful search tool. And then um, if you read a reference book, uh, say you're reading a reference book about something specific, if you actually look in the uh, biography of the, or the, the um, books listed at the end of the um, reference books, mm -hmm. there's a whole list of new reference books and it just kind of goes on from there. Uh, the footnotes and books are the best part of books as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, that's true. Just like the notes yeah. at the end of books when you write the, yeah. Yeah, the facts. Um, so you did, was it a lot different, this kind of research from, you've got 12 Regency era romance and two anthologies, right? That's, yes. That's a lot. Of yes, books. yes, so, yes. So was it very, very different? And there's, there's so many things I want to ask you about that. Like the, just the, 
the thought process because everything everything's different. Did you, yeah, I, did you enjoy the change? What was it like? I did. I think um, people ask, well, how much research do you have to do? Well, I think any writer writing in any genre or any type of book, whether it's contemporary or a thriller or a mystery or romance or historical fiction, you're, you're still doing research on your subject matter for sure. Um, yeah, once, you're, once I'm on book number five or six of Regency, um, the settings is a lot more familiar. So you're not going back to research the small things quite as much. Um, but yeah, so this was kind of a brand new set of research and a brand new set of understanding what their day-to-day -day lives look like, what surrounded them, the little things and that sort of, that sort of thing. So uh, when I write, I try just to write and quite often uh, I will just put a placeholder and go back. And then, for example, if I didn't know what the telephone would look like, I don't stop writing and go back and try to find what the telephone would look like. I'll just leave a little note for myself to right. come back and, and figure out exactly, find out what exactly what the telephone would have looked like or how it would have worked at that particular time. Right. So then when you're with, with your writing process, do you like research everything ahead of time or as you go? When I'm writing, I kind of research the basics and then I start writing it. And then as I'm writing, I figure out what kind of research I need to do. Is that how it works for you? Yeah, the big parts, like the foundation of your research has to be done, I think, at the beginning. Um, but yeah, as you're writing, it's the, the little things that pop up here and there. And, and you do a lot of research as you go then, for sure. Yeah. Um, so the characters, their way of thinking between Regency and World War II, that would be so different. Did you find it easier to relate to them? Like, as um, Yes and no. Um, when I, in my Regency books, I tend to, um, I tend to base my heroines on pretty forward thinking real life heroines that actually existed during the time. Uh, so uh, typically feminists, typically people very pro education, pro, uh, just not afraid to be different. Um, so in terms of writing, switching over to a different time period, I think my characters, at least my my heroines, were very similar in that way. So their mindset, I don't think, was different. But for sure, the response that they got, in some cases, was different. And in other cases, <laughs> nothing has changed. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> nothing has changed. Like the radio. So, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Well, and so do you think that you're going to keep writing along this, this time period? Or do you think you're going to go back or...? I think, I'll, I think I'd like to keep writing in both. Um, it's just, it's each, it's not a one or the other. I like, it, each has its own, um, each brings me so much joy in terms of what you can explore and what you can do. And yeah, you have a lot of, you can really kind of push your horizons a little bit by writing in multiple. And I, I like that. I like that idea. Yeah, I like that too. I'm, um, I think my next one, well, the next one that comes out is World War II, but then the next one after that's going to be World War I. And yeah. then I'm going to go back in time to the 1800s. So I like to switch it up a little bit too. And there's a, there's a lot of World War books out there. And it, it's that there's a, that discussion that's going on right now. Is there too much? Is there too much World War history books? And I don't think so. I don't think that's possible. Do you? Do you think that, like, are we done with that subject? Do you think? Or? I don't. I don't think so. I, oh. I mean, I, I'm not an expert on marketing and sales and all of that stuff, but there's for sure a, a fascination with, with, with that whole period of World War II. And you can read a dozen World War II set books and there are a dozen different stories about a dozen different things. So um, you get to experience a different piece of history in a completely different way. Yeah. So I, I, it's not the same story being told over and over and over again. Like these are completely different stories. Um, and I could say the same writing uh, historical romance. My books are set during the Regency. Uh, there's a huge demand for that period of time from readers who really enjoy that period for whatever their reasons are. Yeah. And again, you can read a dozen different Regency set historical romances and they're all different stories and they all address something different that happened. I got a lot of history and a lot of 
true stories to work with. And I don't think you ever run out of of stories. I don't think so. And I don't think you can get tired of it either. I mean, I think I've read the last probably half dozen books that I've read have been World War II, a couple of World War Ones. And that, and I, I've gotten to the point where I open and go, oh, okay, back to the World War, we'll read it again. And then within page page one, usually it's like, oh, this is a cool new slant on it. That's very interesting. So you, yeah. brought, you brought up another thing I want to ask you about because people ask me this all the time and I don't have I don't have the knowledge to answer it properly, but you do. And that is, <laughs> people ask, what is the difference between historical fiction and historical romance? Which is, it's kind of a tough question because I feel like it, there's romance in the fiction, but I don't know, what, how would you interpret it? I think I interpret it in historical, so you have historical fiction, and even in my book, there's for sure romantic elements in it. There's a love story that plays out. Um, but I wouldn't say it's the focus of the book. Mm-hmm. It's not the crux of the book. It doesn't drive the plot. Uh, it's In this book, it's the partnership of two very different women um, that end up driving the plot. Whereas in historical romance, it's the relationship between uh, the two characters that have a romantic relationship uh, the man, the woman, the man, the man, the woman, the woman, whatever who happen to be reading. And it's their relationship and the development of their relationship that drives the plot. Yeah, so that would be, that's my understanding. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. That's how I was thinking, but you are the one with the, with the experience doing that. So I want to make <laughs> sure with you. So, um, and, and I've, you know, there's different ways of looking at them both. And I, I love them for their own separate entities. You know, they they are different genres set in the past, but different genres with their own, their own gifts. I love them all. But that's me. I just love to read everything. So me too. <laughs> everything. <laughs> Thank you for coming on here and talking to us all. Um, um, I'm going to remind everybody to pre-order this book again. It's coming out one week before mine. So April 21, is it Kelly? April 20th. Yeah. 20, April 20. So you can pre-order that. It's called the Paris Apartment. And uh, yeah, you should go and sign up for it right now. So thank you very much uh, for coming out and chatting with me, chatting with us. And And thank you very much for having me. And best of luck with the book. Thank you very much. Take care. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.